This is me again, Patricia Windrow at the Cable Easel, with this program which is dedicated and devoted to painting from life. Uh, there is something very challenging about getting out there and painting from life. However, in the winter time, because of technology, uh, we go out with a crew of one and a camera and we shoot a scene of my choosing, bring it back and project it on the monitor. And uh, people who've been watching this show for a while sees that that's the way we bring landscapes inside the studio. Uh, when I work uh, on still lifes, I bring the still life in, of course. But the landscapes are brought in via the electronic medium. And um, it's a technique which can be used by anybody who happens to have a videotape recorder. So the, um, the first part of the program was composition and layout, and also explaining how the... Uh, the um, landscapes are arrived at through very simple line layout and this one turned out to be not more than a five line layout uh, to go over it again would be uh, would be I think unnecessary because I'm hoping that this program is looked at rather faithfully <laughs> and here is part two of a program which is called Long Island First Snowfall which happened just a while back now, uh, while, I'm, uh, while I'm talking to you, I'm going to once again repeat that through some mysterious uh, um, action, uh, the water close to the shoreline many, many times is much darker than it is uh, in the for mi middle ground or background. And so I've mixed up uh, some dark blue, which is a combination of cerulean blue, ultramarine white, and some uh, touch of orange and a touch of purple. In other words, it's a whole bunch of tones that have been put together to achieve this. It is a, an experimental mixing of color because uh, I, the formula can change according to the uh, time of day. Uh, in maybe an hour or so, the color of this water near the shoreline could change to something more greenish or more uh, sepia toned. And so what I'm doing now is merely to is merely to put in what there is there at this moment. This scene took about, well, let me see how many, how long we were there. It took about 45 minutes to shoot, and that means that uh, if 45 minutes later there was a difference in the color tones of the water. Uh, I think the only way that you can experience this is by getting out there and working in the environment. As you can see, I am blending these two tones together uh, and trying to get a somewhat um, uh, smooth blend, which um, is not really necessary in uh, palette knife painting. What you're after is more texture and the proper color. But if there is a blend, such as this water near the shoreline being dark and blending up to something lighter, then there is the, um, the need to pull the dark color over the light and to try to get a a, a quasi blend um, quasi blend well that's a good one and so um, the uh, the putting in of the water is a preparation for what is going to happen uh, now namely this little peninsula that sticks out in the middle of the um, of the water which is the area in which one finds long beach and short beach so for the people who've just tuned in, if you're trying to orient yourselves as to where this local scene is, it's from the Kings Park Bluff. And um, uh, a quite wonderful scene. It's looking east. Uh, so uh, 
you know, there are many people who talk to me about my show and they say, we always like to hear where you are when you're taking, when you're doing these scenes. Now, um, uh, the sand uh, of the, of this short beach area is, I'm going to put it on all at once. Uh, this is not what you see on the monitor, but this is logically what is happening out there this is the the underside of the of the little sand spit which is covered with snow for this program and but i'm putting it all in first to explain and to once again reinforce the business that we are that i'm working in layers uh you uh, you put paint on top of other paint in order to get the effect and it's quite logical that if i'm painting a sand spit uh that i put the sand on first and then through the wonderful business of being able to be uh, a painter, you can apply the snow and leave the areas that are showing uh, as sand. So, as you can see on the monitor, that's exactly what there is. There is sand underneath, sand underneath here, and it may be a little bit darker. Maybe we should put a, a sort of a nice uh, swipe of, uh, s uh, mix some deep burnt sienna in with this sand color and run it across here where I see there's quite a dark area that maybe it's because it's wet. And uh, the logic of things is what interests me. I like to know that the reason that this, maybe that this is darker here is because it is in fact wet sand. So there we have it. It's going to be, I'm preparing it to receive some more, uh, some snow. Uh, I'd like to, as long as I have this sand, uh, this sand tone mixed up, I'm going to uh, jump down towards the uh, water line and put the put the sand in against the water line, which can be very interpretive and very. Uh, um, very textured because we're looking way down this has got to be a drop of uh, f between 40 and 60 feet i believe but you do see that shoreline down there and it's the uh, sand cup but it's getting darker so let me let me squeeze out some of this burnt sienna and uh, mix it with this other medium which is called zek and here it is it's this sort of colorless looking blob but it is translucent and it's what uh, gives the pigment of the uh, darker colors their drying ability. The, um, the MG quick drying white is what makes pale colors dry fast, uh, but the, um, the Zek, which is what it's called, is what allows the dark colors to dry fast. And you can see that this is a quite dark color that I'm mixing up here. And so I needed to put in the uh, medium that darkens it. It's interesting, when you buy the MG quick drying white in any of the shops that sell art supplies, the uh, Zek is not sold in tandem with it, and it should be, because it's a companion uh, medium for quick drying the paints. And so when you go to, if you do, in fact, to follow my advice, and you go to the art store and ask for quick drying white and put out by the Grumbacher people, that's why it's called MG, M. Grumbacher, uh, you will say, I need the Zek that goes with it. And many times I find that the salespeople um, have learned something when I tell them that it is a companion piece to the white. Just a small piece of information that I have gathered along the way. The dark, oh, let me put, an, let me put another nice uh, swipe of very rich darkness on the little sand spit across the way there before I start to sprinkle the snow on. There's a, there's a certain power, don't you know, in being able to make something snow on my canvas. Um, I'm going to, uh, I've, I need to put a, just a few more s swipes of this pale sand here in the foreground and talk to you a little bit about going out and painting in the winter. You don't have to paint outside in the winter. It's all virtually impossible. You really can't work with gloves on. You can't get comfortable. The wind is too strong. You get frostbitten. So the answer is uh, the uh, videotaping of these scenes. By all means, investigate the possibilities, and I think you will find that you do not have to, uh, to uh, say, I can't paint uh, winter scenes because I can't go out and do it. It is perfectly possible, and I have done it myself with my own camcorder, to go out and videotape a scene, bring it back, set it up on the, on the television screen, and paint. You have to, of course, be willing to paint in your living room, and that sometimes can be great fun, providing you do not eat at the same same time at the coffee table when you are working in front of, am I setting the scene for everybody that you've got the coffee table all set up and you've got the videotape on and you're going to be working there in the living room. No food. This is uh, uh, one of my 
first pieces of advice, no eating when you paint, it is a bad idea and actually must be avoided at all costs. So if your children pick up paints, make sure that you eat first or after, not during. Uh, so we've got this prepared to receive some snow. Let's, uh, let, me, um, let me show you that in order to do that, you have to wipe this palette knife clean until it shines so that there's no other color in there that is going to mix with the white and give you a problem. Uh, there is, um, there is uh, a need to do this in one nice, fast, uh, not fast, one well-controlled um, application of color here. Uh, I think that uh, the heavier the application of snow color, the better. You will get a nice texture and you'll also get the, uh, you get the uh, uh, very acceptable accidents that will happen when you apply the paint this way. I picked up some of the color on, my, on, my, uh, on the paint before, so I had to wipe the palette knife clean. As you notice here, this, this little strange shape on the horseshoe is coming out pure white in the water because there is snow there. And let me see, it's quite dark underneath. So let me show you that right, right away before too much time goes by, I'm going to darken that uh, area directly below that white that I just put in. Uh, as you can see, I'm working on a very nice uh, palette that I told um, the audience in my first show. I cut this out of an old canvas, and you do not have to go and spend a fortune on a palette. All of these things that are prepared for you to spend your hard-earned money in the art shop are unnecessary. I, I believe far more in the, in the dedication of painting rather than in the money that you spend in, in the art store for things which are, which are many, many times unnecessary. The darkness that comes underneath here is more than likely um, a little bit less, uh, uh, I'm going to, uh, I'll make that thinner. But it is uh, definitely in here, in this area, where the water has come into here. And it's also definitely underneath this little, um, this little uh, bank of snow right here. Uh, the, uh, the snow scenes on Long Island are actually quite amazing. The, uh, there's nothing really quite like them. As delicious as the summer scenes are, so are the winter ones. And uh, they are very easy to live with. White is a wonderful color to live with. And if you have a, you can make a very large painting with a lot of white color and it's very easy to live with. Um, it, it, not so with green pictures that happen in the summer, but in winter time, the, the wonderful muted tones of winter colors are, are lovely pieces and they should be, um, they should be very carefully thought about doing them. Um, we are. I'm going, to, I'm going to probably take a break in a short, a short time. Uh, I wanted to uh, show you how you would handle the application of this darker tone here. And then to, once again, get the palette full of color and begin to, uh, to apply the snow. You see, I'm covering up all that I put on there before, except maybe for a few uh, areas where the sand will be showing through. Uh, here it becomes uh, visible. There are little places that the sand is showing through. And all of this is very logical that, um, that uh, the snow, of course, does not hit everything unless, of course, we're living in Anchorage and we're not. The, uh, the wind blows on the water and it removes some of the snow, which makes all these textures quite wonderful. Uh, as you can see, there, is, there are blobs and blotches and uh, mounds of snow uh, on this little sand spit. And I've almost totally covered the sand spit, but there's enough to make you comprehend that that's what's happening out there. That snow has fallen on top of sand. Uh, I hope that, um, I hope that the, uh, the, the demonstration is not only helpful, but also makes some sense. The, uh, the, uh, the business about making sense when you paint is, is what I'm after also. Some of the other shows say, well, this will do. That's pretty good. That's not bad. Uh, you know, let's, uh, let, l let's see if uh, that's not too bad. I never want to be able to say, this is not too bad. I wanted, to, I wanted to say this is really quite good, and this is what I'm after. So there are some of the, there are some of the application of the paint. I also see that as time has gone by with this, um, with this uh, st study, some, uh, a, a little wave has built up at the end of this, of this peninsula here, and it has, um, it's caused some, a little bit of a white sort of a necklace out here on the end on the edge here which is uh, which is another nice introduction of something and it can only happen if you're there um, when you're there that's when you see it let me get this darker part out that's not there at all there we are and there is um 
there is a little bit of a pattern here it sort of comes out that way and it, it, it it's a little it's a little wave that is lapping up against that uh, against that shoreline I also see that somewhere here the water may be very shallow and there is a uh, there is a strip of of sand sandy colored uh, water. Uh, it, it's probably because the water is quite shallow there, and you can see the sand color through it. Uh, this is all for, for for what makes the interest in the picture, because we live in an area where the shoreline changes, and if it's shallow there, then that's why this is happening. Uh, the uh, the need to um, I'm going to have to squeeze some more paint out, so I think I'm going to take a break. Oh, let me put a little bit of this sand sand tone against the shoreline in the distance here. You will see that there is that there is a barely visible uh, little strip of um, of shoreline here where the snow has not hit. Doubtlessly, the waves came up and washed the snow away from this shoreline, but it's all there. And as long as you've got if uh, you got you've got a palette full color of color. Put it on. This is the time, I think, for a break. I'm going to squeeze out some more paint. So don't go away. I'll be right back. back again after a very short break and let's go on and try to conclude this with some well some more information about where we are and what the place means and um, to wind up uh, with the details which is going to be done the details are going to be done with a brush uh, there are certain details that you simply cannot do without without a brush and that's these wonderful trees but I am putting this snowbank here and there are some shadows rather intense shadows in this snowbank and uh, that is uh, that is going to be all behind many many bushes and many of uh, those wonderful uh, leafless uh, trees that are there so let me uh, change the instrument and go to my uh, go to my uh, brush which is going to put the details of these wonderful uh, uh, little, um, very designy uh, uh, twigs and bushes that are out. Incidentally, this uh, scene was shot by uh, Matt Garfine, who is the director here, and it was uh, beautifully done and uh, very well composed. So uh, I, I must say that um, not only is, have, I, have I got a nice crew and bunch of people doing it, but they are learning day by day and more than likely will deplace me, dethrone me, and take, take over from now on. However, if that's possible, so be it. Anyway, I'm really grateful to the, to the people whom I work with. It's, it's, it's never right to not uh, say something about the people who've got something to do with this show. Uh, I am a mere tiny instrument of it. Whatever goes into it is coming from many, many other people. If you'll see that these details, which are, you, which are being called, this is called framing details. This is framing the picture and I do not intend to spend uh, the next, uh, the rest of the program showing you how this is all going to be filled in with these itty bitty minuscule branches. When the painting is finished, all these little branches will of course be uh, sort of interpretively recorded, but you have to get the idea of how you apply it against all this wonderful, uh, very um, 
heavy paint. You, can, uh, you must do the heavy paint and the palette knife first. And then the intrigue is, of course, that you've got the mixture of techniques. You've got the very fine twig uh, wintry branches. And this is, by the way, a combination of ultramarine blue and burnt sienna. Uh, don't use black. It's, um, uh, it's, a, it's a dead color. And it's not, it's not particularly interesting to use black for your silhouetted branches. Uh, use the deep tones of the... Um, of the burnt sienna and the um, of, and the uh, ultramarine, the um, the trees that I have here in the foreground that are that are uh, growing on this um, on this s uh, snowy bank, I'm going to put in with a um, with a swipe of this uh, of this palette knife just for the trunks because they are thicker than the rest and that can be put in uh, with um, hopefully one sweep of color. Uh, let me see, it, it grows li li like, I, I'd be surprised if this is a birch, but it sure as heck looks like a birch. Uh, it's got a sort of a whitish uh, ground, and um, I just was told by one of our camera persons that um, this uh, peninsula here, sticking out into the water from Short Beach, uh, has been, de has been uh, declared by the Nature Conservancy as a... Uh, a foul retreat, <laughs> that's, that's not meant to be as a joke, as a retreat for the, le the least tern, which is an endangered species on the island, and this is their nesting grounds. And so they've put up signs all over the place that say, do not disturb the wildlife and the birds and so on, and stay off the dunes and this and that. And all of these things are absolutely vital to uh, preserving this island, uh, this realm, uh, the way we want it. Um, it's up to all of us, not the Conservancy alone, but to everybody to pay attention to what we have here and to, by golly, save it, rescue it before it goes away. I mean, who can resist such a scene? Um, well, we've, got, uh, we've laid the groundwork for these foreground bushes, which are intensely busy with all kinds of wonderful knobby and, uh, and um, detailed little things. And the, uh, the need to practice the use of this kind of brush, of course, is absolutely vital. You have to learn how to use these small, this small brush, and you will see that the side of this tree is getting a shadow side. Uh, and also probably a little tiny bit of texture just to tell you that that more than likely is a birch. Um, there is no need to dwell on it. This is not a seed catalog illustration. This is a painting. And what you're trying to do is to get the essence of it. Uh, but the essence of it means that e even something as um, tiny as the shadow on a foreground bunch of bushes uh, must be attended to at least once or twice, maybe not a thousand times, but at least you must show that there is a, it's the insinuation which is interesting. Uh, to insinuate something is sometimes as interesting as telling the whole story, which is what I'm, which I'm, which is, you know, many times what you do with um, interpretive and uh, palette knife painting is to insinuate what you're seeing. Yeah, so, here we have the, 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 the detail of all this foreground here, of which there are many, many dozens, maybe even hundreds of brush strokes. And as you can see, the finer they are, the more you will get of the anatomy of these wintry things, where, whereby there is not one leaf present, and it is all maybe turning even sort of gray looking because there are so many of them. That's the anatomy of it. Uh, uh, I pay attention to these uh, to these details and, and hope that you can because I find that in the other programs, uh, many many other programs, a still life painting is reduced to doing uh, a, a, a a kind of an accidental hopeful um, technique that um, if you if you hit the canvas with a with some paint and it sort of is triangular, you can kind of hope that it looks like a pine tree. I am after having uh, far more attention paid to the real construction of these items, uh, of, these, of these motifs, which is what they are. Not only uh, is it interesting to learn how to do it, but you also learn an awful lot about the, about the trees. You learn how they grow, and you learn what they do in various seasons of the year, and you, uh, you kind of almost know, and you get to know them almost uh, personally. Uh, I'm guessing that this is a willow. It could be, it could be something else. Uh, in the wintertime, it's very hard to tell. But I'm guessing that some stray willow seed found itself on this hillside. Maybe even some wonderful uh, uh, Henry Thoreau type person came out and planted these, uh, these, um, uh, these uh, maybe a birch, maybe it's a birch. 
so maybe they may they were purposefully planted to retain the hillside and to prevent erosion. Whatever it is, it certainly is an asset to this wonderful scene here. Um, I'm going to be doing, uh, hopefully, some more winter scenes. The winter is, you know, barely one third over. And, uh, and as I do them, of course, they will be done entirely from life. Uh, when, I, when I come up here to do my once a month live television show on Tuesday nights, uh, the last Tuesday of every month. Uh, the hope is, of course, that there will be good weather to go and do a shoot and also to be able to find glamorous weather conditions such as uh, uh, heavy snowfalls. I remember one uh, year we had something very close and akin to a blizzard and I was out the next day having the best time recording it. Uh, there was a lot of devastation, an awful lot of people without lights and so on, so there is a downside to these things, but also the upside is the is the absolutely wonderful visuals that take place when these weather conditions prevail. You will see here that on the side there are a lot of uh, very interesting um, deeper toned um, uh, branches that are coming out. Obviously the whole cliff here has got a lot of growth on it. But also up here at the top of the picture as another what you call a framing motif is a overhanging branch from a uh, from obviously from a tree that's uh, that is uh, behind the so-called uh, viewer and it, it is um, it is interrupting this skyline I'm bringing it down a little bit further than what you see because I remember that that's the way it looked but for the most part these things are to be uh, are to be put in there and recorded because well, they are all part of the um, of the mystery and of composi compositions from life. Uh, interpretive, of course, and see how they see how they dip down. And they have some wonderful, sort of lovely fluid motions about them. Uh, the um, the uh, the the variety of this tree is unknown to me. I just know that it's got a wonderful branch that does this, and it comes down into the uh, into the sky and sort of ends in a in a little knob of nothing. But it's all very intriguing, and it's just as wonderful when a bird flies by, and that same thing happens. And oh, this little guy comes over to the side here. Well, there's maybe a leaf left over. But as you can see, all of these details are uh, are. Um, are important on a painting that seems to be just a bunch of patterns of color, but then you can come along with this nice, uh, this nice. Uh, well, it's a it's a sort of a secret that the um, that this is what you see out there. And if you don't get out there and see it in the winter time, you're going to miss it because it's going to be gone in about six or seven weeks. All of this will be gone. It'll be all covered with that uh, those horrible spring blossoms and green, beautiful, luscious buds and so forth. So uh, this is this is the time to do it. Now, uh, of course, uh, there are some in the foreground here. Uh, I sure do carry on about foreground and, uh, and details. But way down here, there is a really heavy growth of things which turns the whole foreground almost into a, into a thicket. Uh, that's the term. This is a, this is a leafless thicket. And uh, the, uh, the laying of the color down first enables you to do these thickets very um, uh, faithfully to show uh, to show uh, w what it's about. Uh, most of the people who see my paintings like them because of the attention to detail. Uh, that's very nice. It's very complimentary. I can't seem to get away from it. I want to be able to show tremendous detail, but also be interpretive at the same time. So I've hopefully to try to reach the happy medium between the two. Time, of course, has run out. Uh, I must uh, say that I don't, don't, don't think that it's wise to work so quickly on a painting of this uh, complexity, but um, this is, after all, just a demonstration. This is not considered to be fine arts. If it is going to be fine art, I will have to re revise it and work on it in my studio and refine some of these things which are extremely crude and which have been done in a very short period of time. I do, however, however, want to sign it because a lot of people ask me about how to sign pictures. I like to sign them in my own handwriting and I usually do it with the brush that I have done grasses or weeds with because it becomes like a flexible pen. And a painting without a signature is, uh, is a phone call without a name. Uh, put your names on your paintings and do not be shy about it. We are, the world is too full of paintings that are signed anonymous because the painter was not proud enough of his work to sign it. So get rid of the guilt and sign whatever you work and uh, if you want to deny it later, you can. However, put the year on too because that's going to be important. 30 years from now you'll say, did I do that in 92? Okay. So there we have it, a program devoted to painting from life. 
This is the first snowfall on Long Island. I hope you liked it. I hope you learned something. And don't forget, watch the papers for when I'll come back again. Bye-bye. Pat Windrow at the Cable Easel. Thank you.